Okay, so my name's Ross, uh, and recently, um, after the last Wuthering Bites, I don't know if anybody recalls uh, another artist called Hua Young Young. She did a talk about making text adventures. Well, I kind of work with Hua Young, and this is what we've been doing since then. Um, sort of since then, we've formed a kind of artist collective called Domestic Science, uh, and we've been trying to make more and more text adventures. So, can I just ask how many people have played a text adventure? Oh, that's quite a good show of hands. Brilliant. Okay. Uh, has anybody heard of Twine? Right. That's, that's good. That's, that's why I came to this conference. Um, yeah, so um, we've been making, uh, I mean, right, text adventures. I'll start from the beginning. Okay. Right, first off, the sort of slightly stupid name of the talk, which isn't an acronym, because that's what it would be, and it doesn't really mean anything. Um, when I say off-grid, I'll have to admit, I'm not really very off-grid, certainly after the last talk. Uh, but what I kind of mean by that is, when I used to play text adventures, and then if you continue to try and do so now with contemporary ones, often called interactive fiction, um, you tend to do it on your own. You tend to do it on your computer. You tend to do it indoors. And I kind of wanted, I just had this idea, I'd much prefer to do that outdoors in weird places. Um, also, the non-fiction bit, I'm kind of interested in how games could be about real places rather than always fictional ones, um, so hence the non-fiction. Uh, and also, they are games that I can just about make as a non-programmer. Um, when I first started making text adventures when I was 12 on the ZX Spectrum, I was still a non-programmer, and I still am a non-programmer, and I used a, some software called The Quill. Anybody remember that? Oh, brilliant. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so, and then recently I found the emulator on the Internet Archive, and I started make, remaking a game I made when I was 12. But anyway, that's another story. Um, yeah, so, so you can see here, this is my colleague, Glenn, and, and this is our most off-grid text adventure that I'll come back to. It's solar-powered. Uh, it only turns itself on when it opens the lid. But I'll come back to that. Yeah, so there's probably the first text adventure I played, which is The Hobbit. So um, a few years ago, uh, I worked in a primary school in Millham in Cumbria. Um, and it was kind of my proudest moment that I managed to make a class of children play The Hobbit. Um, unfortunately, they, didn't, they kind of didn't quite see the value of it at first. Uh, they were told, oh, there's these two guys. You're going to make a game with them over this week. And they're like, yes! We're going to make a game. And it's like, make them play The Hobbit. And they were like, so disappointed. Um, but eventually, they sort of, once they realized the sort of horrendous limits and lack of graphics, they kind of got into it and kind of started making much more complicated games than the ones that I've been making in Twine using something called Inform, which is a much like a classic, more of a classic text adventure. Um, what we've been making is kind of choose your own adventure games. Yeah, so anyway, the other thing is they are cheap to make. You can make them with a class of primary school kids if you want to. It's a bit more difficult to make, you know, a bit of GTA with a class of kids, unless you're a bit of a Unity person or something. Um, yeah, and then coming back to that thing, why play games in your house when you can play them with a pork pie in a castle in the Lake District? Um, so this is um, a text adventure about Ray Castle. I don't know if anybody ever has been to Ray Castle on the banks of Windermere. Um, and it's kind of like a murder mystery that we built in Twine. So you can kind of export it really simply to a web browser and then p kids could just play it on cheap tablets as they <coughs> wandered around the castle. Um, let's see, where are we? Yeah, so that's one of the first little projects I did was in Grisdale Forest. Um, where I wanted, at the time I was doing a lot of work with Minecraft and trying to make Minecraft maps based on the real world. So we did this little project where uh, I was using, um, is that gonna work? Oh no, it doesn't work. I can go left and right, but I can't go down, sorry. Yeah, so, so in the forest, uh, we were doing this project with some biologists from Lancaster University and we were taking slime mold, taking photographs of it and then kind of using those photographs to build Minecraft worlds. Uh, and then we kind, of, we kind of put them on a, 
uh, pocket mine server that I could serve off my phone and then people who visited the little clearing in the forest could sort of play it. So that was like a, an early kind of prototype. Um, oops. Yeah, and then going back to the Ray Castle project and on another Minecraft theme, I was doing something where I worked with Patrick Fenner um, and we made a little radio control system so you could kind of, uh, children in the castle could hide these Minecraft blocks and then they'd send their parents to go and find them. And when they found them, they'd press the button and it would send a radio message through the sort of Edwardian concrete onto the um, Minecraft server that was just on a little Raspberry Pi downstairs. Um, so this project about Ray Castle was um, kind of interesting because I don't know if you know anything about that castle, but it's apart from it being a place where Beatrix Potter went on holiday once for two weeks, <laughs> it was also the home of the Merchant Navy's radio, kind of a radio communications college, and they were there for about 20 years. Uh, then after that, some scientists called the Freshwater Biological Association, who still work today, uh, they were based there for 30 years, but for some reason, everyone's talking about Beatrix Potter in that castle and not the other stuff. So our project was to try and remind people and the sort of family audiences who visited about those histories. So that's where we ended up with this kind of weird radio Minecraft hybrid thing. Um, right. This is, sorry, I, I'd have this habit of putting my own notes on the thing. Yeah, so... So yeah, that's the main thing really. I, I, I love making games about where, where you are and where you play the game kind of affects what's inside the game. It's a, a very basic thing, but it, is, it just seems nice that where you play it could be affected, affect what's, how you play it and what's inside it. Um, that's really annoying, sorry. We've got left and right working, but not up and down. So I started to think of, well, you know, we can make the subject matter um, non-fiction quite easily. We just write it. But I was kind of interested in, well, could we do stuff where we've got sensors in the castle, say, and it works on the temperature and it'll tell you if it's hot or cold. Um, so, you know, I started prototyping little things where you just, you know, you'd go one way and it would read the, it would change temperature or that kind of thing. Uh, what else is there? Sorry. Yeah, and so when we were doing that, we were trying to work out, well, if I wanted to do that, I need some sort of easy system as a non-programmer to sort of do that. Um, so I worked with Adrian McEwen um, to make a sort of a kind of pop-up little pie server that would take radio temperature, uh, temperature readings and then post them in somewhere, you know, on, internally on the same server just for the game, but also... You could post them to the internet and you could make all kinds of games. You could have a, the kids in the school could make, you know, 10 different games, but still using the same temperature sensors, but making them do different things. So we, so we made this little system called the Cocklecraft of Things. So um, I'll maybe, sh I'll show you the link to this talk and you can click on all the yellow links if you want to find out more. Um, so it was just something that you could, you know, download off GitHub and without too much technical knowledge, you could set up a server that would post temperature. Uh, and initially, we just made graphs in Minecraft um, before, you know, before we ended up uh, making text adventures where the strings of text respond to it. So, you know, if it's over 35 degrees, it's hot, or if it's under zero, it's freezing, or if it's minus 180 Kelvin or whatever, it's like you're in space. Um, Yeah, and then we took that kind of system uh, and gave it to Hua Young, who was doing a project in uh, Brazil, where she was talking about working with a... It, they were a kind of more off-grid community. Um, and they were talking about how fresh water's dealt with in Brazil. Uh, and she made a text adventure based on that. She kind of went a completely different way, but I built the kind of systems so that she could take it. And uh, even though she'd have very limited power, she could put the sensors in the river in Brazil, serve a little game off the pie, and for that afternoon at least, people could get online to the game with their phones and then you'd interact with the data in that kind of way. So 
Yeah, so that, that's quite interesting if you want to play that game from that link. Um, Laura, do you want to give me a 10 minute warning? when? Because yep. I'm not very good at timekeeping. Yeah, so after we did that kind of experiment, we uh, were commissioned by Minerva Heritage, who were working with the Hadrian's Cavalry Exhibition. And this is like a touring uh, exhibition across 10 museums along Hadrian's Wall. Uh, they had all these kind of great artifacts from the history of um, the sort of cavalry that was based at Hadrian's Wall. So they, were in, they wanted us to make some sort of artwork about that. And it was also about trying to make people visit more than one museum because they're all kind of strangely interlinked, well, just by the wall. But, um, so we ended up um, inventing this project called Mile Castles. Um, so, and for us, it was like another chance to, I suppose what I liked about the text adventures, is they're really simple, easy things to make. And once you have them in a space, it's like you've already changed the space in some way. Um, and also the way, you know, if you read a story about something and you, get, and you visit the place, you've kind of already entered a sort of virtual space. It's like, it's like augmenting things without a massive VR headset or something. Um, but then the problem with it was we were, because these museums, a lot of them were kind of, had really dodgy connectivity. Some of them you couldn't even get like a text message somewhere. So if we'd have made a nice, you know, twine game on a, for you to download, you wouldn't really be able to download it in all cases. And plus, we didn't like the idea that you had to have a smartphone to play it. And it's like some kids don't, or they, their dad won't let them have it, or that kind of thing. So we were trying to think of a different, an even lower scale way of kind of playing a game. So, so we ended up with the idea of just taking really little cheap RFID tags and, and then we'd, ha we'd place little screens. These are like um, uh, little text screens and we'd hide them in the context of the museum. And if you just took your RFID card, you could stick it on the box and it would read the card and it would store what was happening in the game on your kind of on these kind of little tags with the little face on. So, so you'd go up to the box and the box would read your tag and it would give you some text which would say, you are playing Mile Castles, you need a horse. Please go to the stables to find a horse. And then you'd have to find a box in the context of the stables, place your tag on there and it would go, you have a horse, well done move on and practice archery. And, and that was the kind of dynamic of the game. Uh, and each museum would have three to four boxes. And like a twine game, it's like a choose your own adventure. So your choice of what you did, whether you got a horse or you didn't bother getting a horse, or if you gave um, a tribute to Mars, the god Mars or the god Epona, you'd have to visit different boxes to make those kind of choices. So it was kind of, it started becoming a more and more, it's a much more modest kind of engineering than a spacecraft. But to us, it just, we ended up building this really strange <coughs> system to make a choose your own adventure game. Um, and then we kind of realized that um, as we were making our own little boxes, we're kind of used to making little things like this, I suppose. Uh, so I'm based in Does Liverpool, a hacker space, maker space in Liverpool. So I'd make things like that, but I wouldn't normally make 30 of them. So the kind of engineering thing got bigger and bigger for us. Um, and I suppose we kind of realized that instead of making you know, a, a game for a phone, we were making a game and we were also making our, kind of making our own phone. Even though all the bits were, looked like they'd all fit together without much work, they ended up being quite an elaborate thing that we do, uh, worked with Kevin Hoyle of Shrimping in Morecambe. I don't know if you know. Kevin, uh, so he came up with this kind of system uh, to have the, the nice text display. So that kind of lit up white, which was, they were very nice. And then we had MicroPython running on these ESP8266 boards that we got all excited about just because they were like eight pounds, served their own Wi-Fi, really quite low power, <laughs> not like a Pi at all because the Pi just does so many things at the same time. Um, we were really interested in the, that sort of really constrained system and building it on that. And plus we had to buy 30 of them. So 
the cheaper we could get the components, the kind of better. Um, yeah. What's I going to say? Oh no, not yet. Yeah, so there you go. You can see that kind of the interaction of how do you choose the next thing that you're going to do. If you want to look for inspiration, you find box three. If you want to go to the blacksmith, you go to box one. Uh, but if you go to the blacksmith too early, he's really grumpy and he won't let you, he won't give you anything. Um, so we had all these kind of choices that people would kind of play. And the beauty of it was that basically if you wanted to go to the blacksmith, um, you had to go outside, hoof it up a hill to visit uh, the box that was in an old Roman street and you'd have to log into the box, um, which kids really love doing that sort of thing, but adults really hate it. <laughs> so we had one museum who just said, yeah, yeah, it's going really well. Yeah, the kids love it. The adults have complained that it's too far away, so we moved it. And we were like, I don't think you're quite getting... <laughs> Never mind. Okay, that's good. I'm glad they're playing it. So anyway, yes, the choose your adventure thing. Um, plus, we came up with this sort of weird realisation that it was taking us longer to finish the hardware before we'd written the game. So we ended up making a sort of nice system for emulating the game, um, which I was going to show, but it's being a bit flaky. Um, so it did mean that as artists who are used to just friendly sort of GUIs to make things, we had to make our text adventures in JSON, which is a bit kind of weird, but it was, but it, we ended up this really interesting uh, system that we're now working with some local libraries to try and author the games with young people as well. Um, and yeah, if you find the link, there's a really elaborate description of what Avatap is that is worth a read if you're interested in that kind of stuff. Um, um, yeah, the other thing we really liked, and this is, um, I've chosen Glenn here because he's kind of quite into ideas of, he likes walking and he likes games, so and he's kind of interested in psychogeographic literature and stuff. So we really like the idea that because the game boxes were in the sort of environment, you could sort of play with the context of it and you could get them to just, you can, you'd be surprised what you can ask children to do and grown-ups and artists. If you ask them to carry a stone, they will like, oh yeah, this stone, got it. <coughs> couldn't get, take it. Um, so you can see Glenn doing that. Um, the nicest thing about that is that the game boxes don't know whether you're doing it. There's no way of validating it. It's just that people will just do silly things if you ask them to do it. Uh, and if you find that out, then that's even better. You found out you can just skip all that if you want to, but loads of people would know they could skip it, but just kind of do it anyway. So that became a sort of part of the system we didn't realize was there and you didn't have to do any code. You could just tell people to like, just act weird in museums, so it was good. But then the thing is they would act weird, but in a non-fiction way. They would like, you know, think about the context of where they were. Their weirdness would be in the style of a Roman soldier, so. Um, yeah, um, am I okay for time? Um, yeah, so I'm gonna move on to the sort of latest project we're doing, which is a, a kind of, I don't know if you've heard of James Med's Awkward Arcade project, where basically he was, like us, frustrated with any kind of indie game that you, you discover online or whatever. They're often, you can only really play them on your own laptop at home. Uh, you can share them and you can rant about them online, but it'd be much nicer if you could play them like the arcades of the past. You could put a pint on top of them. These are specially designed so that you can put a pint on top of the kiosk. Uh, so we thought, and one of the games is this awesome game called Queers in Love at the End of the World, which I, I think you should all play. It's very, it's sort of sexy and beautiful in a sort of slightly inappropriate way, but it is really good. <laughs> um, so, so, we, so we were so interested in the idea of putting text, these kind of text adventures <laughs> as an arcade game that we thought we need to just have an arcade of our own that was specifically for these kind of games. So. This has been touring in uh, Liverpool in a Toxteth library, uh, the Exchange in the West End of Morecambe and in Barrow Library. Um, so, and then alongside that, we're making games with people in the library. Um, but for this, we really wanted to focus on 
the um, going back to the sensors thing, um, it was all really well doing your own temperature sensing and stuff like that. I don't know why I just I never seem to make it past temperature. It's like I've got a temperature sensor. <laughs> I need to start using it because there's just so many other interesting things on the internet that you could get games to respond to. Um, so we decided to make these games that were inspired by bits of data you'd find online. So for some reason, the Office of National Statistics seemed to be a choice we all went for. So I'll give you a quick demo. Um, will my mouse work? OK. There you go. Might work. Oh yeah, yeah. So Glenn make a game, a game based on when he worked in the co-op in 1998 to 1999, and he like when he was working there, he took a photograph every day. Um, but then what he's done is that he's based the game on the sort of uh, household goods prices at the time, which he found found that data set online, and then you have to do extremely menial tasks in the co-op. You can. <laughs> You can get the milk. Let's well, let's just play, shall we? This is what this is how exciting nonfiction is. You could, you know, you know, explore what happens when an ASDA is threatening to open down the road. You can't really get more exciting than that. Obviously, there's always like weird music being played in supermarkets. So he's also got a data set of basically all the. The all the songs that were playing when he took the photograph. <laughs> so who let the dogs out? On that one. Uh, so let's take. Let's go get the meat. Oh, there's no. No, there's no stereo out there. Weirdly, the co-op in 1997 had their own radio station. Ten minutes. Um, anyway, yeah, I'm going to quickly. I could spend all day in the co-op. <laughs> I don't know, it all became down to supermarkets, this whole project. Uh, so Hua Young, she's made, it's, it's kind of like a wiki. If you're somebody, not a rich, she's originally from kind of Texas via Korea or something like that. But, you know, if you wanted to make a, wik, a wiki about English food shopping habits from 19, sort of early 90s onwards, then this is the sort of game that you'd end up with. So... Uh, let's go for a ready meal. What do you reckon? Five minutes, ten minutes? We've only got ten minutes, so let's do... <laughs> oh, there you go. So it, and it's just basically her kind of map of <coughs> English shopping habits. And it has to have... Because it's where young, it has to have a pun in the title, so these British Isles. Yeah, so that's that. Sorry. Um, yeah, the thing I was really excited about in the non-fiction idea was that... Uh, do you know when, you, when, you, when I was hearing... When you hear politicians speak, you kind of expect it to sort of make a judgment call on what they say. So, but generally, you have to kind of, oh, I kind of believe what he's saying. But it's like, but is what he's saying correct? Uh, I don't know. I can't seem to access that data right now. And, and I kind of just thought, rather than believing what people say, wouldn't it be good if when people said it, it was annotated in a way that you could kind of make a proper call on it. That was the idea. So I've tried to make a really short game um, about household finances because what especially annoys me is when people think, use the metaphor of a household finance sort of system uh, as to why you can't spend on public services. So I tried to make a game that's kind of about that. Um, so you can all play this later, but um, so this is my quick. It's really s silly. Um, so there's your budget. You can pay the rent. Right, done that. Shopping. Yep. Okay. Bills. Oh dear. <laughs> right. Uh, I don't know what to do about that really. Uh, print money. No, you can't really do that. Uh, well, no. Oh, but wait, but I think as an economy, you can sometimes do that. And anyway, so I was trying to explore that. Uh, and I kind of wanted to see if there was any data. Like, you can get that off gov.uk, which is surprisingly on message about austerity. Anyway, um, I wondered if you could get, you could make a game that used, you know, some proper economic models, because I'm not an economist. Um, but I know that household economies, households and economies are two different things. You know, 
I have a budget of maybe £10,000 a year, whereas the economy has a £770 billion budget. So there's going to be differences. Uh, so I tried to find some models. So this, this, looks, this looks clever. Uh, yeah, this is about a growth model. And look, you, that's interactive, isn't it? Look. But I don't know. I still don't know. Should, we, should you spend on public services when you've got a deficit? I don't know if that tells me. Okay. Uh, let me try the other one. Um, what does this one do? This feels. This says the word Keynesian in it, which makes me feel like I know what's <laughs> happening. Um, that sort of projects things, but it does still doesn't really tell me. Um, yeah. Anyway, so you eventually you just try to find is there a data set somewhere that could help you? I found one that was kind of close to it, um, where someone had worked out how much austerity. I mean, this is slightly out of date, but you can see that it's kind of it's costing up austerity and how it would affect people in the household. So, so this guy, Simon, who worked it out, so you can look that up, there's Simon. Um, he worked out that it's, it kind of costs each household three and a half thousand pounds. So I thought, okay, well, maybe we could put back that into the game. So, so I did. We've got less money now, so uh, let's see. Oh, shit. Uh, let me see. Ah, dear. Okay. I think I might have to work in that co-op again. Um, yeah. It's not working. Yeah. So anyway, that was, that was... So I wanted to put that in libraries all around the north of England and the south. Um, and let's see where we're going. That's us making some games. And if... You'd like to sort of help us make even more complicated games about the mundanity of existence. Uh, you can join us on the 6th and the 7th of October in Toxteth Library, and we're working with people like Adrian McEwen. I don't know if Dave Mee's here. He's doing some stuff in the, over the weekend. Uh, he's made a really nice uh, way of using things like Node-RED, so you can get live data to, to post it inside the Twine game. So it was the idea that we could have... Um, we could show other artists or text adventure, you know, um, what's the word for us? I don't know, hobbyists uh, or professional text adventure writers, how you could, um, you know, use all the sort of wealth of data that's out there and sort of make these kind of stories about it. Uh, a final thing I'll say is that I tried to explain interactive nonfiction to someone and then I realised I was just explaining like a book to them. It was, like, it was quite embarrassing. But really, the internet is interactive non-fiction and fiction. Uh, but I suppose text adventures are just a nice way of not getting too lost on it being the internet and you get back to the sort of storytelling that I think we're all kind of interested in. So thanks very much. <laughs>